Well, hello, Andrew here again, and today we're at episode 191, and um, we're moving into the final stages. Uh, Jesus is, as we'll see, is about to enter Gethsemane, and uh, we will just talk briefly about what happens there. And so we pick up the narrative at Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I'm deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. We often look at the cross as the place where the final battle is fought. It isn't. I don't think it is. It's here. It's in Gethsemane. It's here that Jesus once and for all makes that 100% decision. I spoke about this, uh, I think, a few episodes ago, about the difference between 98 and 100%. This is where the 100% is made. The price is high. We can sense that in the words of verses 37 and 38, here we are, verse 37, he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Grieved, agitated, deeply distressed. Anyone who's experienced anxiety, and I have, anxiety which threatens to completely overwhelm one, will understand something of what Jesus is going through. It's horrible. And it's part of the process. It's here that the place, it's at this place that the future is in fact resolved. It's here that the decision is made. Any thought of a possible alternative path, of a way of escape, is once and for all finally laid aside. It's the decision of imagining that there might be Sorry, it's the tension of imagining that there might be another way. Even the sliver of, ray of, of a ray of hope that this doesn't need to happen, that feeds the anxiety. We can see the process unfolding in Jesus' prayers. The first one, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus is kind of 90% there. The horror of what is ahead has his attention. He's time travelling into the future, into the sufferings of the next 24 hours. And, as we always do, imagining the worst. And that's what anxiety basically is. It's time travel. It's projecting ourselves, even a second, into the future. One of the best novels I've ever read was Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 
the first circle. It starts with a middle-level Soviet diplomat. His name is Inokenti Volodin. And it starts with him making a telephone call to a much-loved university professor that was one who mentored him. He knows that this telephone conversation will be recorded and he knows that attempts will be made to find out who the caller was. It finishes in time just over a week and over 700 pages later. And we find him on his way in a taxi thinking he's going to the airport and then discovering that he's not going to the airport and he finds himself in the Lubyanka which is the headquarters of the MGB, the uh, Soviet secret police and he knows that it's all over. He has lived in a state of anxiety the whole week and what he discovers is that what happens to him is worse than what he imagined. It's far worse. Yet, it comes as a relief because it is better than his fear. I thought it's very, very insightful. The, the suffering, the indignities which were here, he was put to were actually worse than he imagined. Yet the fear that accompanied his imaginings, the anxiety that went with it, the terror of it, was worse than the reality. I get that. I think he's right. And I, in a sense, think this is, in a sense, also what's happening with Jesus here. And it's in the second of the prayers that we see the progress in Jesus towards 100%. So remember, we'll just have the first prayer. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Let this cup pass from me. And now the second. My Father, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. If this cup cannot pass unless I drink it. Notice the progression. The progression is of Jesus moving towards acceptance. We can see the shift that's happening. And I can imagine that in the third prayer, which is not articulated, it says here in the NRSV that he used the same words, but I could imagine we also see the completion of that move towards a 100% decision. And odd though it might sound, I want to suggest that with it comes a measure of peace. Jesus is now resolved. The doubts, the tensions, the possibilities of an escape route have all been cut off. And he knows what he must do. But he's not simply staring into the dark without vision or hope of the future. Hebrews 12 and 2 shows us that what helps Jesus is that he's able to look beyond the next 24 hours into eternity. We read, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. For the joy set before him. What joy? I want to suggest it's a vision of you and me sharing eternity that is now front and centre for Jesus. As I said before, he does not go as a helpless victim. No one takes his life from him, he tells us. He offers it up freely. This is his choice. Although it might appear otherwise, it's actually Jesus who's in control. He goes willingly. He goes with a clear-eyed understanding of what he is doing and why he's doing it. It's here in Gethsemane, in this moment that the battle is finally decided. It's often thus. That's not where we would think, obviously, in the public and the spectacular. It's in the quiet, where the will is set, where the issues are resolved, the decision irrevocably made. We will see that in the way he deals with the military, the civil and the religious authorities. There's a freedom in Jesus. He's not afraid of what they can do to him. He's already accepted that, has chosen that path. 
It allows him to be clear and clean in all his words, in all his dealings. And it's here, in Gethsemane, that this decision is made. It's a decision made for you. It's a decision made for me. Thank God. God bless you.